purposefully and deliberately and carefully through different channels. You've looked at a little bit of the history of Israel, which is essential to know. You've looked at the accuracy, the incredible, brilliant accuracy of the, the prophecies of the Old Testament, and we can thereby rely on the prophecies of the New in the book of Revelation. You've been guided through the book of Daniel enough to understand the keys you need to unlock the book of Revelation. Um, and you've been given enough of a general picture of the scenario of Christ's return to have a good grounding to build your own uh, comprehension based on what the New Testament reveals. Now, why is it so important? I, I hear the comment as a very young and inexperienced Christian, I made it myself. Why is it important to know about the Lord's return in any detail? It's enough just to know that he's coming. Um, let me say, it didn't take me long to realise that that for me was a very naive viewpoint and not sufficient. What alerted me to it was as I read through my New Testament for the first time, I discovered there is not one book that does not allude to or specifically mention and teach on the Lord's return. There are two of them, Revelation, which is almost exclusively, and Second Thessalonians, almost exclusively about the Lord's return. And there are numerous other references. In fact, the number of references to the Lord's return would outnumber about 40 to 1, the number of references to his first coming and to his resurrection. So it appears to me that God puts a rather high premium on us having knowledge, understanding and anticipation of the return of his son. Uh, and if, if we're looking for the wrong things or we're looking in the wrong places or we're looking at the wrong time, we can completely miss what God wants. So it's only been in the last two or three that we've actually started looking at the Lord's return under the nature of his return. And this morning we're going to start on the times of his return and once we get through that, we're going to take a break for a while and then we'll come back later in the year uh, and I'll take you through the book of Revelation. Amen. Come on. Because by now, I hope you'll understand more of it than you would have if I had done that at this time last year. But I still want to look at Jesus coming because as Matt so joyfully shouted there before, he could come before another two weeks. Um, I want you to understand this morning that all the signs bar one of Christ's return are actually being fulfilled all around us right now or have well and truly been fulfilled in history. So there's nothing to wait for except one thing, and that is the armies moving in on Israel. That could happen like that. It's, it's not a matter of when, or sorry, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when that will happen. It could happen tomorrow morning. It could happen now. It could happen in a month's time. It could happen in five years' time. But they will be attacked. And Christ's return will end that attack. It's the one sign that we are given that is seldom spoken of, brought from Zechariah, but it is a vital one. Everything else is here as long as you're not waiting for mythical temples to be built. And as long as you're not hoping that you're going to magically be zapped out of the world invisibly and you'll have a glory time in heaven while the world goes to rack and ruin. Because if you do, you must have a very hard time explaining what's happening around us right now. So this morning we're starting on the times of Christ's return. And I've lost my little clicker. You can see it? Ah, oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Which I'll forget to use anyway, but it doesn't matter. Um, so, we've gone through that, and this morning we're into the times of Christ's return. What should we be looking at? Now, let me say, everything I'm going to share with you this morning is going to be brief because it's already happened. The first thing we get, turn to Luke chapter 21. Because Luke chapter 21 is sort of the, the Bible in the Bible, if you like on the return of the Lord, where he answers the three questions that the disciples asked him um, when 
he spoke to them that the temple that they were admiring was going to be destroyed. They said, they said when will this happen? And when will you return and what will be the signs of your returning? When it happened was 70 AD. The rest of it is still been unfolding over the last 2,000 years. Firstly, Luke chapter 21 and verse 9. In response to their question, Jesus gave them signs to look out for. We'll pick it up in verse 8. He replied, Watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name claiming I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. So one of the things preceding the return of Christ is warfare. Most of you are old enough to be well aware that the world has been at war continuously, non-stop, since 1939. We all think that when World War II ended in 1945, war stopped. It didn't because by the time that Second World War had ended, the war in Korea had kicked off. By the time the war in Korea ended, the war in Vietnam had kicked off. And we've had a series of battles since then that have involved more than just local brushes, okay? We have had warfare at a degree and of a nature not previously known. And we are now <laughs> blessed with a government that is, that is, well, I have to say that because the Bible says it's a beautiful thing. that God appoints the government that we deserve. I mean, that we need. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's both, actually, because there's nothing godly about, whoa, gee, when did we last have a godly government? Um, ooh, probably back in the wartime. Um, but the one we've got now is doing everything it can and the, the one that's just recently been kicked out federally did everything they could to provoke war with China. Uh, it's still going on. The US seems to be madly fanning the flames from their end and they're encouraging little old Australia to stand out in the front line. We're with you all the way, son but you take the first step. Um, if you notice that's the pattern with America, they will find someone and they'll push them out to the front. And they get beaten up and then America sort of comes in and helps them around the corners. We're seeing it happen right now in, in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, sorry, the Ukraine. Afghanistan was another one though, in the Ukraine right now, yep. Uh, and so it goes on. So times of war and revolution. There's more of this than what you might think because I would never have conceived that the nation that I live in, in a time of peace, would lock people in their homes and have the police beat them up if they dare to break the curfews. I would never have conceived that any government would be able to close the state borders in a country like Australia for no benefit, for no gain, but for huge amounts of trouble. Domestic violence shot up immeasurably during the shutdowns of people into their homes and the economy shot down immeasurably due to the prohibition on the transaction of normal business. And at the moment, we're in a little bit of a, a breathing space, but don't think it's over because it's not. What was the excuse for that? An imaginary pestilence. I'm not saying there wasn't a virus, there certainly was a virus, but the proof is in the pudding and the numbers are already out there that those who died from um, vaccine injuries are greater than those who died from COVID. It's been a bad flu, full stop, and we've lived through them before. But around the world, or sorry, around the Western world, the rest of the world's been smart enough not to do it, except for China. Around the Western world, we've watched our economy destroyed by our own government as it has declared war on us. I don't know if you think of it that way, but they have. The state governments are the same. They have declared war on their own people. Never could I have conceived Australia being in that position. It never has been before. 
but it will never be out of it now because once they've had a taste of blood, that's it. Secondly, times of sickness and disease. Yes, well, we don't need to probably go into that because that has justified the first one. This is not to say that some people have had really, really bad doses of COVID, but some people have really, really bad doses of flu. And the actual official figures of death indicate that in, in uh, 2019, the number of deaths from influenza was higher than the number of deaths from COVID by a big margin. Uh, I didn't notice anybody closing anything down in 2019. What's going on? There's been a global change. Our government is about to sign up to an agreement giving the World Health Organization the complete authority to override any government we might have and declare that Australia, for example, is in a state of pandemic and introduce whatever control measures they like and our government will have no say over them. They are about to willingly sign that agreement. Why? Why? I don't know what they're getting out of it. We're either being governed by the most stupid people who need to be instructed on how to draw the next breath or they're being handsomely rewarded. Uh, the cynic in me kind of thinks there's probably a bit of handsome reward going on here. Um, anyway, times of sickness and disease. It's Hebrews 21, sorry, Luke 21, 10. Uh, times of famine, <clears throat> Luke 21, 11. We don't hear it anymore. It's, it hasn't, it, it, it's gone from the television screens uh, when the African subcontinent is in dire need of food, parts of India, dire need of food, parts of China, dire need of food. We don't get the reports anymore. That's not fashionable. There's far more important things to report on now and to fill the news, such as who's got a rainbow flag flying over their building. That's far more important than knowing who is actually dying because they don't have food. At the worst of the famines that we have seen, it's never been reported broadly that nations like America, in order to keep their farm prices high, pour hundreds of thousands of tonnes of foods into the sea. And I, I don't know whether Australia does that or not. I don't know if they're still subsidising their corn farmers over there, but the reason the Americans are so addicted to sugar is that they have massive amounts of corn that they can't use. So they convert it into corn syrup. That's why McDonald's fill their hamburger rolls with sugar because they're getting rid of the corn syrup. Each time you brush your teeth, and they tell you, well, you've got fluoride in there because it strengthens the enamel on your teeth, which no doubt it does do, but they don't tell you what fluoride does to the rest of your body. It's a virulent toxin, but it's a product that is left over from manufacturing enterprises that, well, we'd like to sell it. How can we sell it? I know, we'll put it in the water and tell them it's good for their teeth. I don't know about you, I'd rather be alive with a dental plate than dead with fluoride. I'm, I'm, I'm a sceptic, all right? I've learnt over the last few years in particular, but over many, many years, to be very dubious. When a government says, we're here to help you, run. <laughs> because they've never been here to help you, not since the old days. Do you know when Australia was federated, the, the first government um, after Federation, had a rule that there was not to be any political parties because they knew that as soon as you get parties, you'll get ideology rather than a dedication to the people. And as soon as you get ideology, the will of the people disappears. Well, the very second parliament that we had in Australia introduced amendments to that law to allow the formation of political parties. And what have we got now? We've got the extreme left Greens. We've got the almost extreme left Labor. We've got the extreme left Liberal. We've got a couple of centre parties, then we've got a couple of milky, watery, right-wing conservative parties. All the balance has gone to the left. And ideology runs the country 
not what you want and what I want. When you cast your vote for the local member, which federally here is, uh, I've forgotten her name. Catherine. Catherine, thank you. When you cast your vote for Catherine, the idea is that Catherine is supposed to go to Canberra taking with her the will of the citizens of Ballarat. What Catherine does is come from Canberra and dictate to us what the will of the Labor Party is for Ballarat. And don't you dare talk against it. I could go on, but I don't need to. Times of famine, there is famine in the world around us now at an unprecedented level but it's not reported in the news. Go doing a look for it, search for it, even Google will reluctantly reveal it to you. You will find how bad it really is. Um, and some of the organisations that are around there that are providing assistance, in including Open Doors, can tell you mind-blowing stories of just how bad the food shortages are. Um, next. Times of geological upheaval. How many people know that the continent of Australia is the most stable piece of rock on planet Earth? We are not sitting on any <coughs> tectonic plates. We are not near any fault lines. We are a rock solid piece of land, which is why if you look around Australia, if you've traveled our nation, when you see mountains and things, except in a couple of spots up in Queensland, they're all worn down and eroded because they haven't changed. They haven't been shaken. Once the volcanic stuff stopped, the mountains just sat there. They've all been underwater in the flood. Once the flood washed away, that's it. We are stable. What are we getting in Australia right now? Earthquakes. We got one we felt here in Ballarat. How many of you felt that one? It was last year rattled our windows at home. One down near Melbourne, another one recently up, 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 Kerrang, yes, up in Kerrang, or near Kerrang. Um, when Australia starts to shake, you've got to worry. Any day now, the big one could break loose in San Francisco or the one that's in Tokyo that are both decades past the point where it was predicted that they would come, devastating earthquakes. We are seeing all sorts of seismic activity, which we are told is one of the things to look for just prior to God's return. In fact, when Jesus comes back, his feet will touch down on the Mount of Olives and that will trigger an earthquake so severe that the mountain is going to split in two, leaving a passageway through which the oppressed people of Israel who are fighting a war they can't win will escape by. Then Jesus establishes his kingdom. It's the last sign. We haven't got there, but we're building up to it. The ground is shaking in anticipation. Uh, and times of obscenity and perversion. How many of you carry one of these? How many of you have ever gone to Google and put a search in for something completely innocent and the first page it's taken you to is not innocent? I have my thing set. There are settings on Google search that supposedly uh, will block out the nasty pages. Well, if the ones that get through are not nasty, please don't show me the ones that are. But I can leave my phone in my pocket. I can turn on the TV. What do I get? Obscenity and perversion. There's a program that's apparently rating really well. I can't understand why, but there's obviously a proportion of people out there who like it called Farmer Wants a Wife. I hope I'm not stepping on any toes here. But it's one of the grossest things I've ever seen. Honestly, if you were in genuine courtship, would you want to be followed around by a camera crew doing ultra super close-ups while you have a smooch with your girlfriend or boyfriend? Would that be your idea? Oh, this is a good and acceptable way to start a relationship. And then there's shows like Big Brother, etc., which are better left 
unmentioned. There are entertainments where it now seems impossible. It's impossible these days apparently for a comedian to stand up and not swear with a very few exceptions and they are exceptional comedians. Um, but very few of them. Uh, it's almost unheard of for any television show to not have at least an allusion to a sex scene in it. That's not entertainment. What God gave us for procreation and making children within a marriage is not for entertainment. But that's what the world has done with it. Destiny Rescue that we support pulled out more than 3,000 kids last year who'd been sold into sexual slavery. They've kicked off this year even better. They're, they're going to hit well above that this year. Why? Because the market's there. Nowadays, if, if you blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ, there's not only not a penalty, most people won't even notice that you've done it. When I was a boy, Channel 10 had one of its announcers. Sorry, it was Channel O in those days. Those of you old enough remember Channel Zero. Channel O had one of its announcers talking about something, and I can't remember now what the context of it was, but he used the Lord's name. The following day, the newspapers were full of accounts of the then Australian Bureau of... No, board, no. It's now ACMA. Anyway, the Broadcasting Authority, as the Australian Broadcasting Authority, <laughs> the Broadcasting Authority were going to cancel Channel O's licence. You, you did not swear, you did not blaspheme, because if you did, you, you breached the terms of your licence. Now, there are no terms. Even years ago, when we got the community licence for Good News Radio here in Ballarat, there are... No terms or conditions on that licence whatsoever about language or about blasphemous content. None. Uh, I imagine when the next renewal comes through, it will be full of all sorts of terms and conditions about things pertaining to the rainbow issues and all the other stuff that's on that side. Um, but it still won't have any reference to blasphemy and it certainly won't have references to bad language because now that's accepted as normal. Perversion, sanity in perversion. And it's, it's getting worse before it's getting better. And every great nation or every great empire that precedes us at the end lapsed into obscenity, yep. perversion, yep. corruption in the leadership, broken rules. And that's exactly what we've got now. So within the world, we have reached a point where the world cannot survive much longer. It's about to implode on itself. If Jesus doesn't come back soon, there'll be nothing left. There are also... Oh, come on. Signs in the church that we are given to look for. And this one is often shied away from too, for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, it's probably safer to talk about how bad the world is, but it's not quite so safe to talk about how bad some sectors of the church are becoming. Uh, I'm not afraid to say that. I'm not saying that we're perfect. I'm certainly not saying I'm perfect. But I'm doing my best to hold to this standard, not to the world standard of let's match the world and do what they do. I, I don't want to ape a rock concert Amen. on a Sunday morning. Amen. I can't do it anywhere near as well, uh, or we can't do it anywhere near as well as, as the, say, ACDC or one of the other big, well, they've probably gone now, haven't they? They've retired. But some of the big rock musicians can come in and they can pack stadiums. I, I use ACDC particularly and specifically because of their connections with the satanic, blatant open connections. Uh, I don't know whether Angus still wears devil's horns on his caps, but they still make the sign with the hand, which I'm not going to make, uh, which is a symbol of inviting Satan. And you see the audience around them making those signs. Um, they can play their music loud. 
They have amazing light shows. They have incredible video stuff running on the screen behind them. They have a PA that is so loud it makes Deep Purple sound quiet. And Deep Purple's PA was so high that most people in the front rows of their concerts came away with bleeding ears. Literally bleeding ears. Deafness was common if you sat too close to the PA stacks at, at Deep Purple. ACDC can outdo that. Now what happens? Well, brother, you've got to get with it. So we're going to have very high-powered PA and we're going to have lighting grids out the front. We're going to have all the effects lighting, the moving heads, everything else. We're going to have a mighty big band up the front here. We're going to sing and scream and yell. We're going to throw fog onto the platform. Sorry, not a platform anymore, it's a stage. We're going to do everything they do so that when people come in, they'll feel comfortable. Uh, before I was a Christian, I was a devotee of heavy metal. Not the sort of heavy metal you get now. That didn't exist then, but Deep Purple was, was the epitome of it. Strong, heavy bass riffs, heavy drum, lots of it. Um, and the music had lyrics that were not terribly uplifting. But the beat was what you went for. It was the sound. It made you feel good. You walk into a modern church and there's a plastic copy of Deep Purple giving you the beat that makes you feel good. The same beats, the same timing. Those of you who are musicians know what I'm talking about. There are certain rhythms that our bodies respond to, especially from drums, because the drum can get that thud, 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 thud at just the right rate. Certain pitches in the music affect us. It's measurable, it's scientific. This is not tin foil hat stuff. The fact is we are deeply influenced by music. We were created that way. This is why we had Lee come up this morning and share that brilliant testimony. When I come in here, I f came in here, I felt so flat and the music has just lifted me and I thank the worship team, so do I, but I go beyond the worship team. I thank each and every one of you because you're all part of the worship team. When you start to sing, you lift the room. I don't know how this place feels when the senior sits come in on Monday, but I bet it always feels good because the echoes are still here. We are singing to worship Jesus Christ and we're singing to the best of our ability. And if somebody's a bit off key or one of the musos isn't having a good day and things aren't right, who cares? We want enough light to be able to see by. We want enough video up there to have the words. That's all we're interested in. We are not interested in trying to ape the world because the world does it better than we do. This little bloke, when he came into a church for the first time with his background in heavy metal, I lived in a caravan at that stage. My dad had died. I was on my own. And I had my hi-fi system that I'd built. My speakers are about this high. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Were they black? No, they're brown. <laughs> they're timber. Of course, with me, they'd be timber, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I sat them, when I sit my caravan up, I sat them on the kitchen table and I sat in front of them. The amplifier was beside me on the couch beside me. So it was like a little C-shaped dinette. The speaker's on one side of the table, me on the other, full volume, three or four hours a day. Loved it. That was my life. That was my life. When I wanted to retire from the world, I went into music. I still love music to this day. I love it, but a different kind of music now. I have to be careful because if, if, if I hear Deep Purple playing, I want to listen. But I don't want to listen to their words. I want to listen now to music that glorifies God. I no longer have dirty big speakers up on the table. We've still got them, but Kathy uses them to put stuff on now. I've got a radio sitting on one of them. There's a, there's a little steam engine sitting on the other one. They make good display stands. That's about all they're used for. But the guy that sat there for hour after hour after hour, and it must have driven all the neighbours insane, 
because there would have been no one within a... I was living in my sister's backyard. There was no one would have been within a block of where we lived that didn't know what my favourite music was. <laughs> Came into the church that this one ultimately grew from and there's Barbara Smith with a piano accordion playing It's Beginning to Rain. <laughs> I'll tell you something. If Barbara Smith had got up there and tried to do a rendition of one of Deep Purple's hits and there'd been a drummer on the other side bashing the skins the way they do, if there'd been anything like that, I would have turned around and walked out thinking there's nothing here for me. What I walked into was something radically different. Yes. Southside retains that. We offer something radically different. I'm sorry, we're not screens based. I'm sorry, we are not drum or musician focused. We love the musicians we've got. And if there's a drummer here you want to play and you can play quietly and play harmoniously with the music, fine. I don't have a thing about drums. What I do have is about something that overrides what God wants to do. Brad and I have joked a few times about slinging a truss out the front here and putting some lights on it. But if, we, if ever you walk in and see that, it's a joke, OK? <laughs> Isn't it, Bradley? <laughs> We don't ape the world. What we want is for the world to ape, to mimic, to imitate us. We are trying to show the world a better way, and the better way is the Bible. The better way is Christ. The better way is integrity, is honesty, is truth. The better way is to walk the way God wants us to walk. And it's getting so hard to do it. Because the criticism comes from everywhere now. The church is the biggest enemy of the state. Under the Obama um, uh, administration, it was official. The number one on their list of terrorist organisations was the Pentecostal Charismatic Churches. Well, guess what? Who do you think is high on the list of Australia's enemies in our official Tony Albanese's opinion, to you and I. Why? Because we oppose everything they're trying to do. I think having a wife is precious. Yeah. And Kathy, I hope. Well. She had a vague thought, maybe at the start, that it would be all right, having a husband. <laughs> My Bible says, I don't want a husband, I want a wife. My Bible says, Kathy doesn't want a wife, she wants a husband. And I take great joy in her. That completely opposes the ideology of the day. The most precious grouping in society is the nuclear family. Mum, dad and children. That completely opposes the ideology of the day. Where everything is aimed at breaking families down. Why get married? A fortnight ago I had the joy of performing the wedding for Tanya and, uh, and um, Adrian. And Tanya confided with me that she'd been talking to her friends. They had a, a hen's night. And all of her friends said to her, the modern idea, why on earth do you want to get married? You can have all the benefits without any of the ties. Which is what a lot of people are doing. Do you know why we should get married? Because the reference manual by the manufacturer says we need to. And that runs completely against the ideology that runs the government. So watch it because we're going to see greater and greater levels of pressure coming on the church. And I'm not going to go any further than that. We'll finish this off next week with what we need to be on our guard against.
But certainly I'll tell you this, our faith is under fire and our, the integrity of God's word is under fire. And I don't care who hears me and I don't care what their opinion is, I will never ever stop espousing that what God says goes. Right? There's no other standard, no reference other than what's in here. And as the time of Jesus draws close, it's going to be harder and harder and harder to hold on to this. I'll tell you what, make sure you've got a couple of them hidden away somewhere. Because it won't be all that long, I, I kind of suspect this is Russell, this is nothing else, before they come and try to take them away. I'm amazed there haven't been restrictions on the selling of Bibles already. Because this is the only thing that stands opposed to what Satan is doing. He's having free reign at the moment. He's in complete control of the government. That's obvious. When you have a government that says, yes, we'll, we'll OK abortion. No, we won't allow children to have pain killers as they die if they happen to be born alive. You know you're serving a satanic government that are sacrificing our children to their idols. There's no other way to view it. It's as bad as that. And the church is the only thing that's, that's making the difference. The day is coming when we'll be taken out of the way. There'll be a thousand years where Jesus rules and reigns. But people say, what's that for? It's to give people the opportunity to live their lives without any satanic influence. Yeah. So they won't be able to say, the devil made me do it, or this demon did it, or someone else did it. They'll be on their own, and at the end of that thousand years, Satan will be released. He'll, as easily as that, go around and raise up an army against God. I think it'll be an opportunity for all of us to see that God's judgments are fair and just. It's not the devil made me do it. It's I willingly cooperated. The devil can't make us do anything, but he can encourage us. If he could make us do things, you and I'd be dead. Either at our own hand or somebody else's. We'd be gone. He can't. People believe he can. He can't. Because that stops him. That stops him because that declares that Jesus Christ said it is finished. Yeah. What is finished? His war on Satan. It is finished. Satan is a defeated foe. We're still seeing him lash and kick and struggle and scream. But as someone else shared in a testimony this morning, who was it with the cat? The rat. Who's she? The mouse. It was Lee again. Well, oh, Lee, you've had a good day. <laughs> Lee talking at, yeah, well, Satan looks like a mangled half-eaten rat now and he is a rat, it's a good description um, he's not getting any better with time either we serve the winning side our faith is under fire now is the time not to look away not to say oh, let's not worry about it, you know, Jesus will come one day and fix it all up no, we need to look at it because one of the things that we are under threat with is losing what we're holding on to. Hold on to your faith. Hold on to Christ. And learn to trust the Bible and prayer far more than you do Google and the television set because they both lie to you. They sometimes tell the truth. More often than not, they lie to you. Thank you, Father. As we live in a world that is becoming inimical to the gospel, as it's the, the very literal foundations on which the so-called Western world was built are the principles of scripture, the tenets of scripture, the very foundations that established this nation is, is the gospel. When the first English boats arrived, it didn't come with invading soldiers intent on wiping out existing populations. The first person off the first fleet was a man of God, a missionary. And everywhere the English went, that was their way. And I pray, Father, that as this nation has turned away from its roots and now begins to systematically rewrite history and to deny them, you will give us the strength to hold on to what we know to be true the strength to look not to the world but to you for our daily provision. The strength, Lord, to be courageous in the face of opposition. That's such as we have never known before. This is the great tribulation. It's on us now. And I pray, Father, we will come through it. In Jesus' wonderful name.
Amen. God bless you.